Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss how to synthesize all of the different clinical information that we get when evaluating a patient with cervical spondylosis. In short, we'll talk about how to put it all together. This is an excerpt from a broader course on clinical evaluation of patients with cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in seeing that full course, we've left a link in the description. So in the evaluation of a patient with cervical spondylosis, there are many elements as we have reviewed so far in this chapter. The history, the physical examination, review of imaging, and review of sometimes confirmatory studies, those all go into trying to come up with a diagnosis for a patient. So a diagnosis sometimes feels like a conjecture. You're saying like, listen, I think you've got these symptoms. I think they're coming from this finding on the MRI. We got injections, it seems like it gave you relief. The more stuff you can line up, the more confident you can be in your diagnosis. And I think the more effective you can be in your treatment, whether it's surgical or non-surgical. Now, for surgery to work in the spine, uh, I believe that there are really four important, seemingly redundant, but important uh, rules. Uh, and these are rules that I use. This is not dogma by any means. But the rules that I use are the following, and they seem pretty commonsensical. Number one, patients have to have symptoms coming from their spine or the spinal nerves or the spinal cord. Think about this. So for spine surgery to work, people's problems need to be coming from their spine. That's a simple way of thinking about it. Now, you can always tell that, that it's coming from their spine, but that's important rule number one. Rule number two is people need to have identifiable structural causes for their symptoms. In other words, you have to know what you're trying to accomplish with surgery. You have to be able to say like, there is that disc herniation or that instability or that spinal cord compression. That's what I'm trying to take away. Uh, and I believe that that problem is causing their symptoms. That you have to believe. So number two is people have to have identifiable structural causes for your symptoms that act as the guide for what you're trying to accomplish with surgery if surgery uh, becomes the, the path of choice. Number three, surgeons have to believe that they can fix that structural problem. There are situations where you say like, yes, people have that large disc herniation and it's causing their symptoms, but the treatment is worse than the symptoms they have, for example, or that person can't tolerate surgery. You have to believe that if you were to fit that, number one, that you can go put the patient through something that allows you to fix that structural problem. And then lastly, you have to believe that you can go in and fix it and that that is going to give them relief. Sometimes people can have permanent nerve damage where you go in and take the pressure off the nerve but don't expect the symptoms to get any better. And that's not really that effective in my mind. I wouldn't say surgery worked in that situation because patients likely have the expectation that their symptoms are gonna get better. So number four, you have to believe that fixing that structural problem is gonna relieve their clinical symptoms. So just to reiterate, we're gonna talk primarily about numbers one and number two when doing the clinical evaluation, but later we'll talk a little bit more about surgical decision-making, figuring out what your goals are and figuring out how likely those goals are to really get people relief of their symptoms. So patients have to have problems coming from their spine, they need to have an identifiable structural cause for those symptoms. They, you have to believe, or the surgeon has to believe that they can fix that structural problem. And then lastly, you have to believe that fixing that structural problem is going to give people symptomatic relief. Those are, in my mind, four important rules for making sure surgery is going to work, or at least increasing its chances of working. Now, cervical spondylosis, as we've said before, really involves age-related degeneration. In this picture, you can see that the spinal cord is under pressure. This patient may have cervical myelopathy. Cervical radiculopathy, in this case, this person has a disc herniation over here, uh, causing pressure on the nerve, can cause a symptom pattern of cervical radiculopathy. And then neck pain, of course, may come from a lot of different things, but certainly could come from the arthritis in the neck, the disc degeneration, the osteophytes in the front, could come from muscular things or things like that that can cause neck pain as well. But those are the symptom patterns, to reiterate, that we see with cervical spondylosis. We think about those patterns in a very structured way when we're getting our history, when we're doing our physical examination, and when we're looking at the uh, imaging. Um, when we're trying to put that all together, we think about those symptoms, first of all, we organize them into symptom patterns. 
Then we look for concordance between the history and the physical exam. Then we try to correlate the symptoms and the exam findings with the structural and the imaging findings. And then lastly, on occasion, sometimes frequently, we'll look at confirmatory tests to verify either response to injections or EMG nerve conduction study. And the goal with all of that is to say, yes, we've arrived as confidently as we can at a cause for the symptoms that this person has. And that's a precursor for figuring out what the right treatments are. Now, there are a few important considerations with this. Number one, not all structural findings cause symptoms. And we see this a lot when people come in with imaging findings, for example, on the left with symptoms on the left, but they also can have pressure on the nerve on the right and no symptoms on the right. We see that all the time. But we go into it knowing that just because somebody has a problem on their MRI doesn't mean that that's what's causing their symptoms. Number two, often people can have symptoms that are not coming from the cervical spine, and that's important to recognize as well. There are a lot of things that can cause pain into the neck, cause pain and symptoms into the arms, numbness, things like that. So thinking broadly, having a broad differential diagnosis, being sensitive to like doing a detailed exam that may point to the shoulder or some peripheral nerve problem or thoracic outlet syndrome or something else, all of that I think is important. Important to recognize not all symptoms have to be coming from the cervical spine. Not all tests are perfect. Sometimes people's symptoms don't read the book, that their nerve, their C6 radiculopathy may be different from the classic kind of C6 radiculopathy. Sometimes in exam, the reflexes will be preserved at brachioradialis where you would expect it not to be. Uh, sometimes they'll have like an EMG finding that says the, this C7 nerve is misbehaving, but it's actually C6 from the, you know, the clinical picture and stuff. Putting all this together requires a little bit of tolerance for the fact that all of these tests are a little bit imperfect or may be imperfect. Um, number four, we, surgeons may not be able to address all symptom patterns. I mean, frequently we'll go into surgery for a patient with, say, myelopathy and radiculopathy, but have to establish that, like, listen, we don't know if the neck pain is going to get better. It may, uh, or it may not, but we're really there to address the symptoms going into the arm and address the balance dysfunction and the clumsiness. It helps to go in to surgery with a clear understanding of goals, and it helps to go in for the patient with a clear sense of expectations. Um, and then lastly, some neurological symptoms are just not reversible. People can have permanent nerve damage. And so there are situations where you can see a structural abnormality, uh, but people's symptoms have been so long-standing or multifactorial that you don't have conviction they're really gonna get better with surgery. So fixing something structural may not actually serve the patient best. But those are kind of important considerations when we're thinking about cervical spondylosis and the clinical evaluation. We will talk next about decision-making in it and coming to different strategies for managing people both surgically and non-surgically. But I hope that during the course of this chapter, you've helped understand all of the different components for clinical evaluation for patients with cervical spondylosis. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.